an irritation that affects more than the cars themselves. Jammed up traffic hurts business and reduces property value. Vancouver has become one of the great ports of the Pacific, the transportation hub for Western Canada and a merchandising mark for a million people. Vancouver has developed a big traffic problem too, causing official headaches for Canada's third city. Only 70 years ago, there were no problems. Indeed, there was hardly a city where Vancouver now stands, and the pioneers held their town council beneath a tree at a spot that's now in the heart of the business district. In 1888, at a cost of $16,000, they pushed a bridge south over False Creek. And in 1909, a second bridge was opened with great ceremony and hailed as the engineering marvel of that day. But traffic in the 1940s and 50s piled up each time the old span opened and wheels ground to a stop. Wait, fellas, and rest assured you'll be late for that appointment. Because the majestic swing of the old bridge, while it may have had a beauty all its own, if you had time to appreciate it, was just creating another traffic jam for drivers and traffic police to unravel. It was happening all too often, and usually for something like this. But Vancouver, a city almost surrounded by water, needs bridges. And water commerce must carry on too. Since this old timer was opened in 1909, other spans have been built. Each one serving to bring traffic into the vital downtown area. Each one playing its part in keeping the city tied together as a unit. The problem in 1950 was to plan a new bridge to replace the old Gramble span and take more of the pressure of daily traffic flow. Citizens approved the cost and the exact needs of the future were studied by city engineer John Oliver and his staff, who began the important task of supervising the plans for a completely new and modern bridge. Thousands of plans and blueprints were needed before any work started. Indeed, the bridge was a completed project on paper before any crews arrived on the site. And the engineers and their staff spent many hours on plans for a bridge that would allow all water traffic to pass beneath without interrupting road traffic. Finally, a model was produced. Here was the bridge to be built with eight lanes for traffic, designed to provide an easy link between downtown and the busy suburban areas to the south, with cloverleaf approaches aimed at keeping traffic on the move a bridge in keeping with the majestic setting of the city itself. Vancouver applauded the groundbreaking ceremony when Mayor Fred Hume and members of his council officially set the drills in motion. The bridge was on the way, and before sounds of the applause had died away, the earth movers were at work. Experienced machine operators guided these first steps and swung their loads to waiting trucks. The organization that was to build the bridge in record time was getting underway. And elsewhere, old buildings which had been acquired to make room for the new structure were removed as the wrecking ball did its part to change the skyline of a part of the city. Pile drivers, too, were going to play a big part in this job, hammering down the footings for piers. A jolting experience for the operator, but very essential in providing foundation. And concrete. Before the job was over, thousands of yards of concrete were used, ensuring permanence, stability, strength, and beauty. All these crews began to bring the plans of the engineers into being, working at the first of the many piers to be built. Some of the first rose beside old homes, giving an indication of the design that would take shape over the next few years. The first of many, a good start to a big job. That base rests on a truly solid foundation. Steel and wooden piles to last 500 years. It's a long way down to the bottom. Thousands of piles were driven to give the bridge sturdy roots, extending deep into the ground. On top of them would be built the strong and graceful piers to carry the roadway. Pile driving is an ancient art, and on this job, Hundreds were driven under the water, where much of the foundation work had to be done. The water itself was held back by huge coffer dams during construction. 
piles were cut off uniformly to provide an even base for the piers. And for a while, the bridge building job took on some of the sights and sounds of BC's busy forest. Concrete came next, poured over the foundation. Electric vibrators were used to tamp the concrete as it was spread into position. A familiar sight as the new bridge rose. Piers were built around columns of steel, which arrived on the job completely constructed. So it was only a matter of minutes to get each one into place. A giant crane lifted each column from the truck and swung it through the air into position over the completed base. and with a little guidance from the crew, lowered the steel into place. Next came the job of pouring more concrete around the steel. Like the framework, the concrete arrived on the job ready mixed, and no time was lost guiding it into place. This was all part of the result of the planning that went on long before the actual job started. Down it went all day long, and the vibrators tamped every pound. Piers began shooting up all along the bridge roof, some in the framework stage and some completed. The new Granville Bridge was really underway. And as it took shape, life went on very much the same that summer in the city's park. Here were the people who would soon be able to get about easier and faster in their travels to work and play. To bring these crowds to Stanley Park on a busy summer Sunday, and to have them enjoy themselves knowing that there'd be no traffic jams on the way home, men were working hard on a bridge, while others enjoyed the antics at the zoo. And others stood by while Junior took a ride on a miniature train. A big thrill for the whole family. The bridge was built for people, and the people of Vancouver love to enjoy themselves on a day out at the park or in one of the city's many beaches, where the whole family can romp in the water. Back on the job, there was water too held back by caissons that allowed the crews to go about their work and still keep dry. Ten percent of the cost of the bridge was represented by construction that was eventually covered by the waters of False Creek, as the huge span piers were carefully constructed to hold the weight of the main span. A special bucket was used to pour concrete below water, building up a foundation that would never be seen, but which plays one of the most vital roles of all. A completed span pier ready for steel, and with all of them seen together, it began to look like a bridge. Tons of the sturdy bridge-building steel were trucked to the job and wheeled from the unloading area by a specially constructed train, the only one that will ever use the new bridge. Steel workers had a big job to do, bridging the water with the main span. As the work started, support piers were made ready, and the giant beams were lowered through the air. These men knew their job, and it didn't look hard at all when you stood back and watched the experts as they started to make the steel supports take shape. Sidewalk superintendents on the old bridge seemed to approve. 
Where there's steel, there's riveting to be done. And the man behind the gun made the familiar sound mean business. The central span was taking shape out over the water. Below, the safety man had a job everyone envied. All he did was sit in a rowboat all day. But men high on the steel knew he was there and were glad of it. Main deck steel beams provided the base for the roadway. There, another one in place. One after another, the beams were secured as the outline of the bridge loomed larger on the horizon. Girders for wind bracing were fitted into position as the next step. The first pedestrian. What he needs is a parachute. There's the completed span, high over the old bridge. And none too soon was the job nearing an end, for downtown traffic was getting more congested every month. Everything possible was done to keep the streets clear. If the business section of the city were to survive, the crowd must keep coming to town. There must be a swift and easy way to get there. Sorry, buddy, but when curb space is limited, it must be shared fairly. City action created the Downtown Parking Corporation, whose spacious lots helped to provide a place to leave the car while shopping or on business, with no parking tickets from the police. Old streetcars began to disappear after World War II, as the ancient tracks in the middle of the street were torn up to give traffic more room. The BC Electric speeded conversion to modern trolley coaches, all part of the plan to keep the wheels rolling. One-way streets were to tie in with the new bridge approaches, which were already being used by construction crews still busy on the decking job. Those huge beams demanded specially heavy rivets, so a pneumatic transport hose was devised to speed the process at this stage. The end of the job was the same, a man with a gun and plenty of noise. The decking job on the center span over the water. And this one will never have to open for a tugboat or for anything else. On the deck, the steel base was ready to be covered. Plywood forms were placed into position. This was the beginning of the end, when, in a sense, the road builders took over from the bridge builders. For like all bridges, this one was to be essentially a highway and a badly needed one. Carpenters were back on the job now. Then the laborious handwork of wiring reinforcing steel over the decking, the heart of the roadway to come. A job for many hands, checking and tying each joint. Behind this crew, other men with concrete, transferring it from mixing trucks to the buggies that would carry it up the bridge and into place. A smooth surface for thousands of drivers to pass over in the years to come. And then the process of setting, almost the end of the job now. The dramatic difference between the old and the new. Bridge ideas changed from 1909 to 1954. This veteran sidewalk superintendent knew his vigil was almost over. Time now for the essential finishing touches. The last details everyone had waited for. Railings were welded into position swiftly. The lighting crew needed a giraffe for their part of the job, and they got one, but hardly the original variety. Modern lamps to give daylight conditions at midnight.
painting came next, and the railings got their share. A lot of area had to be covered by that brush, but the man with the real problem worked beneath the bridge, where they'd be painting for years if they hadn't had plenty of help. Service galleries have been built under the bridge to ensure ready access for regular repaint jobs in the years to come. The initial painting was soon completed both underneath the deck and above along the miles of railing. The completed job, the result of years of planning and construction standing for the use of generations yet to come. It all came to a head on a rainy day in early 1954. Once again, Mayor Hume and civic officials gathered on the bridge site, this time to officially open the bridge before a huge crowd who waited for the ribbon cutting. There, a worker chosen by his fellows gets the honor. And an old car that saw the opening of the 1909 bridge leads the way with a load of Vancouver's pioneers. Here was the start of a new era for Vancouver's growing traffic. And here too was the sad end for the old bridge that had served so long. A bridge of beauty to take its place among the renowned modern buildings of the city. Simplicity of line that matches the architecture of this 20th century. Beauty and strength combined by the engineer to provide a wide approach to the center of the city from its many southern suburbs. The third Granville Bridge, a worthy tribute to the pioneers who hewed a city from the forest and laid the groundwork for the Vancouver of the 1950s. A progressive and busy city filled with people going places proud of their newest and greatest bridge, an achievement to match the growth of the city itself. 